Good morning. Um, I'm Jane Winter, um, Professor of Medicine in the Division of Hematology and Oncology um, at the Feinberg School of Medicine, Northwestern University. That's in Chicago. And I welcome you to the ASH 2011 Annual Meeting Press Conference on Lymphoma and Multiple Myeloma. Um, before we begin, I want to remind everyone to please, including the speakers, to turn off our cell phones and pagers so we're not interrupted. After all of the uh, presentations, we will open the floor for questions and finally the phone lines to allow for questions by uh, individuals who can't be here today and have dialed in via teleconference. Um, and to be sure that we have plenty of time for um, all the presentations, we're going to ask you to hold your questions until all the panelists have made their uh, presentations. So we will um, begin first by the presentation on multiple myeloma by Dr. Keith Stewart. And I think it's important that uh, for all of us to understand that understanding the various survival pathways that allow malignant cells to proliferate and grow, and similarly understanding why some of these cells are resistant to all of our different attempts at therapy really is the is the forefront of um, medical research at the current time. And so Keith is going to uh, provide us with some very exciting new insights. Keith. Thank you and good morning. Um, my name is Keith Stewart. I'm a professor of medicine at Mayo Clinic in Arizona. You can come up to the up there? Yeah. Please. Okay. Um, start again. Good morning. Uh, the, the topic of our work is on the mechanism of action of a class of drugs called immune modulators. These were just the, the, the architectural drug is thalidomide, which was discovered in the 1990s serendipitously to be active in multiple myeloma. It now uh, has two closely related compounds, lenalidomide, sold as Revlimid, and a new one which is not yet FDA approved called pomalidomide, all of which are highly active in multiple myeloma and show promise in lymphoma and chronic lymphocytic leukemia. Worldwide, sales of these drugs top about $3 billion a year, and yet, until recently, the mechanism of action was completely unknown. These drugs do many things in cells, but how they get there uh, really was a black box until about a year ago when a group from Japan described uh, some very elegant work in the journal Science that thalidomide had to bind to a protein called cerebron. Not much was known about cerebron at that time except that it was associated with mental retardation, which is where its, its name originally arised from. It turns out, in our, and they had published in that work, that binding to cerebron was absolutely required for the birth defects that were a hallmark of thalidomide that led to its withdrawal from the market back in the 1960s. When we saw that paper, we uh, concluded quite quickly that this may also explain the reason that these class of drugs kill many cancer cells, that it would probably have to work through this protein cerebron. And in our abstract today, we will describe that, in fact, in the absence of cerebron, the drugs have no activity, and that the presence of cerebron is required if, if a patient is going to respond to the drug, and that, therefore, this should serve as a biomarker for responsiveness to select patients who will respond or not respond to Revlimid. One interesting uh, side note, however, to note is that there are many ways you can be resistant to drugs, and Cerebon is not necessarily the only one. And in fact, there are many patients who have normal levels of Cerebon who still respond. I think that's the essence of our story, and I'll stop there and pass it on to Dr. Meyer. Thank you, Dr. Stewart. The next presentation will be by Dr. Ralph Meyer, and for purposes of disclosure, I uh, must tell you that I am a co-author on uh, Dr. Stewart's, um, Dr. Meyer's uh, abstract uh, as the um, chair for the Eastern Cooperative Oncology Group, which participated in his trial. So um, with that disclosure, um, Dr. Meyer is going to tell us about the long-term follow-up 
on a very important clinical trial for Hodgkin's lymphoma. And the treatment of Hodgkin's lymphoma today is a real balance between achieving control of the disease and cure while limiting long-term side effects. And this, uh, this presentation talks to that balance and uh, the importance of long-term follow-up in uh, evaluating our new therapies. So, uh, Dr. Meyer. Thank you, Jane. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Ralph Meyer. I'm the director of Canada's NCIC Clinical Trials Group and a professor in the Department of Oncology at Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario. We began this trial in 1994, and with the premise um, that uh, supported us addressing the question I'm going to tell you about is that uh, the long-term outcomes in patients with Hodgkin's lymphoma depend obviously on the ability to control the cancer itself. Uh, but in addition, the nature of the treatments that are, are given to patients have their own long-term effects, including risks of developing other cancers or cardiovascular problems, which in themselves can be fatal. Most trials assessing patients with limited stage Hodgkin's lymphoma have a, a intermediate lengths of follow-up in the range of four to six years, and they emphasize disease control. Back in the early 1990s, the standard of treatment for these patients was, was with radiation therapy and quite extensive radiation, what was called extended field radiation. That's no longer the practice, and I'll, I'll allude to that in a moment. Uh, it was apparent uh, at that time that deaths from Hodgkin's lymphoma in these patients, once one got out 12 to 14 years, uh, the cause of death for these patients would more commonly be something other than Hodgkin's lymphoma, particularly second cancers and cardiac diseases, uh, which were uh, increased in frequency in comparison with age and sex match controls. This led us to asking the question of whether chemotherapy alone would lead to superior long-term outcomes in comparison with a treatment strategy that included radiation. So we conducted a randomized trial in Canada and the United States that included 405 patients. And they were randomized to treatment that included extended field radiation, either alone if patients were in a favorable risk, or in combination with two cycles of chemotherapy, referred to as ABVD, if they were in an unfavorable risk. And the experimental arm received uh, ABVD. And depending on how they did with their initial two cycles, they received either four cycles, four months, or six months of treatment. We reported the five-year outcomes at this meeting in 2003, and what we showed was that the disease control was superior with the radiation-based therapy, but that there was no difference in overall survival. And that actually was not surprising, uh, given what was known at that time, the, the concern about what are called the late effects associated with radiation therapy don't really start to appear until the second decade and thereafter. The primary outcome of our trial was 12-year overall survival, and we performed the analysis of the final analysis of the trial this past summer. The median follow-up was 11.3 years, so approximately the same as where our endpoint was to be measured. And the overall survival in those receiving chemotherapy uh, was 94%, 12-year overall survival of 94% versus 87% in those assigned to radiation uh, treatment, and that was statistically significant. The reason there were more deaths in the group receiving radiation was because of other causes. There was 24 deaths in the radiation group and 12 in the uh, uh, chemotherapy group. Uh, of the 12 deaths in the chemotherapy group, six were due to Hodgkin's lymphoma and six to other causes. In the radiation group, there was four deaths due to Hodgkin's lymphoma and 20 due to other causes, including 10 due to the development of a new form of cancer. In addition, looking at both fatal and non-fatal, uh, what late effects, there were uh, 26 cardiac events in the um, uh, um, radiation group and 16 in the chemotherapy group. And for second cancers, it was 23 and 10. 
Um, so what these risks, now the, the final piece is that the disease control, that is the disease treatment and the Hodgkin's lymphoma never coming back, was superior in the radiation group. At 12 years it was 92% versus 87%. So what we've shown uh, is that in comparison with that radiation therapy, chemotherapy improves overall survival. And it does so because there's fewer late effects than a treatment strategy that includes radiation. We've also shown that the standard paradigm in cancer treatments of keeping the disease away, being a proxy measure for lo living longer, doesn't apply in this situation because of the issue of the late effects. Compounding that is the fact that this is a highly curative disease and the median age is 35. So in a sense, these patients who are treated in a, in a sort of ironic way have the opportunity 15, 20 years later to have adverse things happen to them. And it emphasizes the importance of the frontline treatment to, um, that is provided. So I'll stop there and turn it back to Jane. Thank you. Next, we will hear from Dr. Lori Sen about a new monoclonal antibody um, for the treatment of B cell lymphomas. This is a new anti CD20. It um, targets the same antigen as rituximab or rituxan, um, the commonly used backbone of most therapy for B cell lymphomas. And this is a newly engineered antibody, one that has been manufactured specifically to improve efficacy. Lori? Thank you, Jane. Um, so as Dr. Winter has stated, um, the drug that is the focus of the trial that I'm going to be talking about is called GA101, and it's one of the novel anti-CD20 monoclonal antibodies in development. So rituximab has been on the market now for more than a decade, and it targets a specific protein that is present on almost all B-cell non-Hodgkin lymphomas. It's considered an immunotherapy, so not only is it directly toxic to lymphoma cells, but it also harnesses the immune system to come in and help fight off the lymphoma. And as a single drug, rituximab really has been one of the most significant impacts in outcome in B-cell lymphomas in, in probably the last several decades. So there's a real motivation to take it one step further and possibly develop a new anti-CD20 antibody that might work better than rituximab or one that may continue to work when rituximab stops working so as to further improve outcomes. So GA101 is a novel anti-CD20 monoclonal antibody, so unlike rituximab or some other anti-CD20s in development, it's considered to be a type 2 monoclonal antibody. It uh, has been shown in preclinical testing to have a better ability to directly cause cell death uh, than its counterparts, and it's also been shown to have a higher effect at um, causing a, an immune type of reaction or a cellular immune response against the lymphoma. But that's in preclinical testing, and what's required now is to move it into patient testing and, and to see whether or not that translates into benefit in patients. So it's already proceeded through various phase one and two trials, and the Gauss study, which is the focus of the abstract at this Sears ASH meeting, was the first head-to-head -head trial that really compared a novel anti-CD20 monoclonal antibody against rituximab. So this is an open-label, randomized phase two trial. Um, it enrolled primarily patients with relapsed, indolent, CD20-positive non-Hodgkin lymphoma, although the focus was to look at its uh, effect in follicular non-Hodgkin lymphoma. It uh, enrolled patients and then randomized them in a one-to-one -one fashion to receive either rituximab or GA101. Both drugs were given as an induction phase with one dose every week for a total of four weeks. And patients who had stable disease or responded then went on to a maintenance phase, which was one dose of either drug administered every two months for two years. So in total, the trial enrolled 175 patients, which uh, included um, 
145 patients uh, with follicular lymphoma. That was 75 patients that were enrolled to <coughs> rituximab and 74 patients who received GA101. The primary endpoint of the trial was response rate uh, as determined by investigators at the end of induction therapy. So with respect to that endpoint, the response rate in the GA101 arm, the overall response rate was 446 and the overall response rate in the rituximab arm was uh, 33%. The complete response rate was 12% in the GA101 arm and 5% in the rituximab arm. In terms of tolerability, the toxicity profile was quite comparable between the GA101 arm and the rituximab arm, although we did see a higher rate of infusion-related reactions in the GA101 arm, most, most of which were mild, and a higher rate of, of cough. At this time point, uh, with a median follow-up of about 15 months, there's no difference in progression-free survival. So uh, overall, you know, the Gauss study was the first attempt to compare a novel anti-CD20 monoclonal antibody against rituximab. Um, there is a trend toward improved response rates with the GA101 compared with rituximab. It had a favorable toxicity profile compared with rituximab, and certainly based on this data, I think the phase three trials to truly test its efficacy are, are warranted, and these trials are now underway. Thank you. Thank you, Lori. So now we move on to chronic lymphocytic leukemia. Dr. Susan O'Brien um, will speak to us about a novel, what we call targeted agent, um, which has, uh, as she will tell you, is uh, really making, um, having a great impact on the treatment of uh, chronic lymphocytic leukemia. Susan. Good morning, I'm Susan O'Brien. I'm a professor of medicine in the Department of Leukemia at UT MD Anderson Cancer Center. Um, and these are really a very exciting class of compounds uh, that are now in clinical trials, this being one of them. Uh, the, uh, high, all of these drugs interfere with B-cell receptor signaling, and the relevance of that is in normal B-cells as well as malignant B-cells, when you ligate the B-cell receptor, that sends a very strong survival and proliferation message to the cell. So if one could interfere with that, that, that might be advantageous. Um, several drugs are in trials, as I mentioned, and target different enzymes in the pathway. PCI32765 targets uh, Bruton's tyrosine kinase, or BTK. And the clinical relevance of this is that the people born with mutations in BTK actually have a disease called X-linked A-gamma globulinemia. Um, PCI32765 is an oral uh, irreversible inhibitor of BTK and can be dosed once daily. And an interesting thing that you see with the, all of these drugs so far that are targeting enzymes in the B-cell receptor pathway is that the initial pattern of response is very different than what we would see with chemotherapy. So initially what you see is very dramatic shrinkage in lymph nodes, but at the same time the absolute lymphocyte count goes up. So initially there appears to be a compartment shift, and there's some nice preclinical data to show why that happens. And one of the big questions when the data first started coming out with these drugs is, well, will the white count come down, or will that be the end of it, or what will happen over time? Um, and, and so it's very interesting as it gets presented at different meetings to see how the responses are evolving. One note is that there is a response category that's kind of new, that's not part of the IWCLL, called nodal response. And if you see that, what that refers to is very early on, you know, there were sometimes patients who had 80, 90 percent shrinkage in their lymph nodes, but their absolute lymphocyte count hadn't been reduced by 50 percent, which is part of the requirement for a partial remission. It didn't seem very sensible to call those people stable disease with the kind of node responses they were having. So you might see them now referred to as nodal responses. So these were people who meet all, uh, have at least 50 percent reduction in lymph node mass, but the white count may still be elevated above baseline or maybe somewhat lower, but not reduced by 50 percent. Once it's reduced by 50 percent, then they would meet the criteria for PR. So uh, it's interesting because when this data was presented at ASH last year, the PR rate uh, was about uh, 25 percent and there was a very high nodal response rate. 
about 90% of people in this phase one trial in a fairly heavily pretreated population had over 50% reduction in their lymph nodes. When this was presented at ASCO in Lugano, same population, the PR rate, and this is all relapse patients, had gone up to 48%, and now currently we're going to report on a response rate of about 70%. Um, so you see how the response has evolved over time. Two doses were used in this trial, 420 and 840. So far there doesn't appear to be any difference, possibly because in fact the phase one showed that at doses of about 420 you could completely inhibit BTK. Other exciting point about these drugs in general is uh, their relative lack of toxicity. So the most common side effect you see with PCI 32765 is diarrhea, which is generally quite mild, easily controlled, and often self-limited and will go away with continued treatment. One of the most exciting things about these agents is that they are not myelosuppressive. And this is a big deal in CLL because all of the treatments that we have uh, pretty much are chemo-based or even somewhat antibody-based treatments. The biggest complication in treating CLL with pretty much every therapy we have is myelosuppression and infection. And of course, these people are immune suppressed to begin with. So to have an agent that's not myelosuppressive and is this effective is very exciting. And the other interesting point is you can see very significant improvements in cytopenias. So people starting with baseline thrombopenia or anemia, that can improve even when their lymphocyte count is still elevated, which is kind of interesting. So again, I think that the excitement here is the efficacy, which is increasing over time, uh, the lack, relative lack of toxicity, and importantly, the lack of, of myelosuppression that we see with these agents. And I think they're really going to change uh, the paradigm for the treatment of CLL. Thank you. And now for our last presentation, which is a what we call a late-breaking abstract, Dr. Brad Call. And again, for purposes of uh, disclosure, I am a member of the Eastern Cooperative Oncology Group Lymphoma Committee, um, but not a co-author on this uh, presentation. But um, Brad is going to speak to us about uh, the um, approach to indolent lymphomas for a long time, a watchful waiting approach has been the standard of care for patients without symptoms and low burden disease. But there's increasing um, evidence, old studies, new study, um, suggesting that uh, single agent therapy with rituximab um, may be appropriate for these patients. And uh, Dr. Call is going to tell us about uh, a comparison of two different strategies. This podium discriminates against tall people. <laughs> so my name is Brad Call. Uh, I'm uh, at the University of Wisconsin, and I'm uh, uh, we're presenting at this meeting results of uh, ECOG study 4402, sometimes referred to as the RESORT study. Uh, RESORT stands for Rituximab Extended Schedule or Retreatment Trial. And uh, this was a study that was really looking at two different rituximab dosing strategies for patients with low tumor burden follicular lymphoma. You, you've already heard a little bit about rituximab from Dr. Sen. It's an antibody. Uh, and when you give it to uh, lymphoma patients, the antibody uh, coats their tumor cells, sticks to the outside of it, and when it does that, it uh, tries to trick the patient's immune system to come in and kill the cancer cells. And from a patient standpoint, it's a very um, attractive therapy because of the safety and side effect profile uh, relative to other drugs we might give like chemotherapy. So. Um, one way in which uh, single-agent rituximab is used is to use the drug to put people in remission and then give the, tr the drug on some regular interval designed to maintain that remission. And that strategy is called maintenance. And the question that we were really trying to address with our study uh, was to look at an alternative strategy in which patients would receive the rituximab, be put into remission, observed then with no further rituximab until they relapse. And at that point, the patient is retreated with rituximab. 
And as long as that strategy works, the patients are eligible to receive that therapy repeatedly until the drug stops working for them. So our, our study was really comparing the strategy of maintenance versus retreatment. And what we were really trying to determine is whether one strategy or the other resulted in better disease control. And the way we defined disease control or timed treatment failure was uh, the patient developing resistance to rituximab, uh, the patient moving on to chemotherapy, or uh, the patients um, becoming unable to complete the planned therapy. And an important secondary endpoint was time to first chemotherapy, and then we also looked at toxicity and quality of life. So uh, the patient population that we conducted this study in is the so-called low tumor burden population, which are patients that have a relatively low volume of disease and are asymptomatic. And it's somewhat controversial even now as to what is the best management strategy for that patient population. Uh, so what our study shows is that the retreatment strategy performed just as well as the maintenance strategy for time to treatment failure. When you look at the endpoint of time to first chemotherapy, the maintenance strategy performed slightly better in a statistically significant way, although both strategies performed extremely well. In, in terms of quality of life, what we're really trying to get at is um, the question of whether there's a psychological advantage to being placed in remission and maintained there. Does that help lessen anxiety relative to coming out of remission, going back into remission, out of remission, going back into remission? And um, our analysis so far shows that there is no quality of life benefit for the maintenance strategy relative to retreatment. From a toxicity standpoint, uh, both regimens were extremely well tolerated with minimal toxicities, but in terms of toxicities leading to a failure event, there was more of those in the maintenance arm. So uh, oh, finally, we looked at, um, at, at um, drug use or doses administered. and. Uh, what we discovered was to get this very small improvement in time to chemotherapy took roughly four times more drug in the maintenance arm. So our conclusions from this study were that um, given that there was no difference in time to treatment failure and given the excellent results with retreatment for time to first chemotherapy, given a slightly better toxicity profile and given the lack of a quality of life benefit for maintenance and given the drug, the resource utilization issue, we concluded that the retreatment strategy would be our recommended strategy when you're administering single agent rituximab in this patient population.